Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. You know, it can be hard to see food and design trends when you're in the thick of them, but we are going to help you out today with some eagle-eyed experts. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, a taste of the local and global trends in food. And teaching the next generation of young children how to grow and prepare their own school lunch. But first, striking designs for classic household items. Towels, vases, lights and stools. The standard staples for many homes, but local and Canadian designers are making them exceptional. And joining us now to show us some of these designs is Annalisa Kelly. Annalisa is founder and principal designer at AK Design. It is so nice to have you here, Annalisa. Thanks Thank for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I know all of these items are featured at the interior design show Vancouver, but these are really timeless items. And <laughs> I remember last year, this is like a furniture store in here. We had so many pieces from the show. but. Where would you like to start now? I'm glad everything is, is a little bit more um, down to scale today. This yeah, is going to work easy well. Easy for us to walk through. That vase catches my eye. What's this about? This vase is made by Cirque. It's a company out of Montreal, and it's actually 3D printed. They're a very cool company because they recycle everything, so they use even the, the, their discards to make other products. And this is their uh, beautiful vase that is based on tulips. Dutch right. tulip. Bulbs. Right. No, yeah. I love it. And, and so you can actually put individual flowers all around. Yeah. Them. I love this idea. Floral and arrangements. it's so light. Yeah. Look at that. It's so cool. I love that. Okay, that's a great piece. Comes in a couple of other colors it's as beautiful. well. Beautiful, yeah. Who doesn't love some lovely linens? What is this? Yeah. These are made by Obaki, by, out of a beautiful store here in Vancouver. And these are uh, luxury Turkish linen and cotton uh, uh, towels, excuse me. And they are, the best thing about these is that all of the proceeds, all the profits from this are going back to Turkey to take care of the earthquake fund. I love Obaki for that. They're always thinking beyond the bottom line. They're yes. always thinking about how they can make the world a better place. Yes. Now these are, <laughs> again, these are towels. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm calling this a scarf. I don't <laughs> know, it's just beautiful. When you get some great fabrics and textures, they're amazing. Just, yeah, Our clients love these. They, they are so thin, mm. but they dry so quickly and they work so well. And they're really luxurious. The more that you use them, actually, they get better and better. Absolutely beautiful. There, we're making a nice little display yes, there. Please, okay, and what about these? Uh, these are handmade from uh, Arbutus Wood by a company called Man and Son. Boom. Yes, and they're wow. gorgeous. You can feel how smooth they are. They're made yeah. handmade oh and tea light holders and lamps. You know, here. I kind of like them all together like this, the, the tea lights with the with the lamps. That all kind of works. Yeah, it? it's all about curation. So little vignettes in your home are what we're creating a lot, and these are perfect for that. Right. Now, what about this beautiful, beautiful piece? This is by a company called Good Beast, and this is their pebble vase, which comes in three sizes, and we love to use this for styling. You can, again, it's about curating different levels and different heights. You can pair it with something like the Cirque vase and flower arrangements now are all about varying heights and different shapes and sizes. Right. It's not uh, right. just about it's same fun. Color. It's easy to hold too. You've yeah. got you kind of got some grips there with those dents in the glass. I love that. It's this perfect. I love. Okay, it's a mushroom. It's cork. What, what's going on here? This is by a company called Paws, and it's for children. They kept children in mind when they designed. So it's all meant to be playful and youthful, um, and also obviously organic and and interesting and and out of nature. But yeah, it's for for a fun, playful mind. So 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 you could use this for a stool, a little yeah. tea table, whatever. You know you know what got my this is really heavy. This is solid cork. Yeah. This, is, this is really light. This is yeah. well let's put the vase on top of this, but you know yeah. I don't think a, that. no no I think I that's, think that's I a dangerous that. you're right. That's a dangerous, dangerous situation. But this just on its own as an accent in any room, you could just you could see that. Yeah. Again, sort of the timeless nature of that. Yeah, Absolutely even just beautiful. as a sculptural piece, but mostly you know playful and, and beautiful and made of cork. I love it. Yeah. And what about this one finally? This is by Capella, and this is a company that is the first really design-driven company for mobility products. So for people who need to sit in the shower, it's a shower stool. It's made out of solid uh, surface. It's waterproof. It's beautiful. I love it comes the, mo in multiple the modeling colors. on the side there, yeah. right? That is just gorgeous. 
That's heavy too. Once that's in place, that's not going to move. That's no, my I safety. Think that, I think that's it's important. important. That's it's really important. important. It's yeah. really, it's. What do you love most about the the world of design, Annalisa? Oh, that's a that's a large question. I but uh, what do I love most is that it's always changing, evolving innovative here to make our lives better to offer something other than just beauty but function and and even and these products are a perfect example of that yeah. outside the box thinking <laughs> thank you so much for coming in thank you so much for having me this is our vancouver so many of you take amazing photographs across our beautiful province, and we always like to feature a few of the ones we receive each week. Well, today, we're highlighting some of the more unusual subjects and framing. First, the moon really does look a little like cheese in this Stanley Park photograph by Dickens Yap. Thank you so much, that's magical. And this large piece of driftwood frames the Burrard Bridge perfectly. Thanks to Cheryl Smith for sharing that one with us. And Warren Lowe says this ship sunk in Green Lake years ago, and people have taken to adding treasure to it. Thank you so much for the photograph. Now, where's the treasure map? So please do send us more. You can send them by email to bcphotos at cbc.ca, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, social change can take a long time. It can take many forms too, black, Indigenous and other women of color, for example, gathered in U.S. Minster in search of career guidance and support. The conference was organized by a nonprofit aiming to empower young girls through workshops and mentorship. As Yasmin Gandam tells us, the event was designed to build and foster confidence. Up until this moment right now, what have you done to show up for you? One of many panelists at the conference uplifting young women of color as they share their experiences as entrepreneurs in the workplace. The Bigger Ideas Conference is the first of its kind in Vancouver, with over 150 women participating in seminars covering everything from career transitions to wellness and preparing for job interviews. As a black woman, I know there's a lot of rooms that I go into and I don't see the same person that looks like me. And that's still going, right? We talk about equality and equity and all these different things, but there's still a struggle if you look at the underlining, right? Speakers from various industries, including finance, wellness, fundraising, and journalism, all gathering to share their voice. So sometimes it takes a collective of other people that look like you for you to feel safe in those spaces. And I think that's what this conference is really about, is about us coming together with our idea, or maybe like we had this in, innate idea in us, like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know know how to start but being in a room with other women who share the sentiment and the frustration of starting something. For participants it's a safe space one that doesn't come around often. Especially young women they're very shy and they um, they're very shy and don't know what to do and kind of looking for that support so having these kind of um, conferences these kind of events that really bring these students and young people together and kind of like show them the path and be a welcoming safe space for them is very very important and there aren't many of that here. But it goes beyond career guidance. The conference also provides the opportunity for women to access resources. A lot of times people don't have access to the monies to be able to access you know those resources and I think you know being able to get connected to community organizations like this one can then give you uh, I guess connections to people who can give you uh, access to resources that can then help you with your mental health. Fruji hopes this is the first of many opportunities for young women to embrace their bigger ideas. Yasmin Gandam, CBC News, New Westminster. Coming up, Johanna Wagstaff gives us a brief history of civilization through fashion. To attempt a brief history of textiles is to attempt the history of civilization. It's no small feat, and it's a history as wrapped in culture, class, and gender politics as it is in science and exploration. So we better get started. In the beginning, 
humans wore animal skins as clothes, but around 11,000 years ago, we began growing crops for textiles and we could truly regulate our body temperatures as we migrated to new climates. Fibers that had to be spun into yarn that would then be looped, woven, knitted into fabrics. And that changed everything. I love your color palette. One of the most famous examples of textile production, silk breeders in China that eventually led to the Silk Road trade route, 8,000 kilometers connecting China to the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, Europe in the Middle Ages made great progress in the working and dyeing of wool, which was used for outerwear with linen close to the skin. Then came tailoring, buttons and lace, which drew textiles closer to the body. And with that, the rise of fashion. And of course, it was in part the demand for cotton that drove the transatlantic slave trade. Great Britain watched the outcome of the American Civil War closely to see what it would mean for their cheap supply. During the Industrial Revolution, fabric making shifted to mass production and assembly lines and sewing machines streamlined the process. Labor issues have gone hand in hand with textile production ever since. In recent decades, it's fast fashion, globalization and consumerism that have taken the spotlight. This is but a mere sampling of the history of the world, I mean textiles, a history that reflects the technologies, cultures, and customs of civilizations through time. Thank you so much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, if you're going to be tracking food trends, you have to taste, taste, taste. That is the motto for our next guest. Christine Cuvelier is president of Culinary Concierge. She is a global culinary trendologist. Christine, welcome. Thank you, Gloria. That sounds like a fancy title. What, what does it mean? It means I am passionate about food. Okay. It means I think about food coming one to five years in the future so I can help my clients and food manufacturers think about launching an on-time, on-trend, great-tasting food product. Okay, so that's a real talent. What's top of mind for you now when I say food trends? Year of the pickle. Really? Absolutely. Okay. Think about artisanal local pickles. Think about pickles with different flavors, some with sweet and heat. What about putting a pickle mm. on your pizza? What? <laughs> I don't know. Pineapple was already pretty yeah. controversial. So pick pickles, I don't know. That's taking it somewhere else. It's okay. fantastic. Pickle juice shots are starting to show up because they're very healthy for our gut. Okay. If you're a real pickle lover, take a large pickle, slice it and put your sausage or your hot dog in there and use it as the bun. Oh, I love that idea. Yep. Great for people who are going gluten-free. Exactly. <laughs> it's, the, it's the bun. What else there? You've got something that looks like taco shells over there. Absolutely. The cuisine of the year is Mexican, but specifically Mexican regional specialties. So figure out where the salsa comes from. Or if you're going to a certain region, for instance, Merida, find out what kind of chilies they use. We're starting to see a lot of tomatillos. That's true. That's and true. poblanos in our markets. Yes. So you can make a fantastic salsa and and do it with a green salsa verde oh you had a slow roasted uh pork shoulder the other day with adobo <sighs> chilies oh. adobo chilies and then you can just after if you leave it in there long enough you just do the pulled pork and it's got perfect gorgeous warm perfect. peppery tones exactly okay okay and then what well up next is the condiment of the year which okay. is chili crisp it's crunchy, chili, crispy, flavorful. Herbs and chilies and sometimes garlic and oil. People will say, now what can you use it on? What can you use that on, Christine? I was just going to ask. Everything. <laughs> Eggs, avocado toast, ah. asparagus. Put it in your dressings and your marinades. Put it as a rub under your chicken or on your pork shoulder that you did. Right. Oh, it would be spectacular. Gives everything a little bit of a kick. You don't quite know, but not too much heat? No, it's flavor, not heat. Okay. Okay, I like that too, because I don't know how much of the heat I, I, can actually, I can actually take. What else have you got here? Next up is Amore, the love of all things Italian. Mm. That resonates with so that, many that people. That never goes out of style. When we're talking trends or fads or whatever, it's just different, different flavors, different sauces of Italian. Exactly. Right? So look for really great olive oil and use olive oil all the time in all your cooking. Watch for fabulous new pasta shapes. Look at this. Now this is called a cavatelli. And in Italian, close on that one, cavatelli means waterfall. Oh, 
I thought it was like kava, like a cave or right. something like that. Okay, beautiful. So that gives lots of place for the sauce to kind of totally. get stuck on, right? Totally. Lots of little wiggles Lots in there. Lots of little wiggles, wiggles for... and caves and funnels. and For things. your Love fabulous that. bolognese sauce, be right in there. Mm. Of course, look for really great balsamic vinegar yes. and beautiful tomatoes. Don't forget about Parmesan crisps. And in Italy, a really fabulous meal always ends with a kiss, so look for some bocce kiss chocolates. Really? Okay, you always have to finish a little bit of sweetness. Okay, and what's in this here? Sun-dried tomatoes. Sun-dried, oh, still, okay. Those are still, I mean, these are kind of classic tomato, I mean, Italian flavors that I would just say go to all the time. You're just saying maybe you spend a little bit extra and get the really fine quality, and you're going to notice that exactly. in the product. And this time of year, isn't it great to take our tomatoes from the garden and make our own sun-dried yes, tomatoes? Yes, I did that this year, and it makes me so, so happy. The, the tomatoes that are growing in the garden and the hummingbirds. That's what gives me the most pleasure <laughs> this year, it seems for sure. What is this? Frozen tomatoes. What's this is a on? frozen tomato. So we're going to make a dish, and we're going to put different flavors on buffalo mozzarella. Now Ooh. you can use bocconcini, you right. can use burrata, whatever right. you have. Right. So we're going to have one with the chili crisp. Oh, is this um, like an appetizer kind of a thing? Absolutely. Okay. It could be an appetizer. Serve it on a bed of arugula or spinach, and it would be spectacular as a, as a main course, too. Mm. I'm going to take my frozen tomato, okay. and I'm going to grate it. Oh, that makes it a lot easier. That and makes it a lot easier. We're going to make a snow. And I'm going to ask if you, can, if you can take the rasp yes. and make a little bit of lemon zest. Look at us. Aren't we productive? Look at this little snow. So we're going to take a little bit of the snow and sprinkle it on our burrata. Oh, lovely. And you're going to put a little lemon zest on top of there. Just a little pinch. Perfect. A little pinch. Oh, it's getting stuck to my fingers. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And then how about a little olive oil on the top of that? I love that idea. Right? I love that idea. So then you would just dip your maybe Parmesan crackers or Absolutely. maybe a piece of bread. It would be great right. with a focaccia or right. a ciabatta. Oh, so what about this one now? And I think the chili crisp on the burrata or the buffalo mozzarella is spectacular. It's creamy. You can taste the crunch. Isn't that beautiful? That is absolutely gorgeous. That is absolutely gorgeous and super simple. And super again, simple. if you don't want to splurge on the on the burrata, the fresh mozzarella is working really well. Oh, it as does well. absolutely. Mm, but I can smell that right now. I, I'm exactly. getting the, the tomato Do you want to have a taste? I sure do. Okay. Let's do, let's dip in this. I want to get the lemon and the cheese and, and the, the snow. Mmm, mmm. Well, that's still very cold, too. Refreshing. I'm getting that, I'm getting the refreshing tomato come through as well. A little bit of salt, salt flakes mm -hmm. or something. That would be fantastic. Too. That would be a really nice finish on that. I try this one too? <laughs> you better try the chili crunch. Better try the chili. We are very fortunate in British Columbia. We have a number of companies that are making local chili crisp. Mmm. Oh, and that does have the crunch. Is there garlic in there as well? Sliced fried garlic. Oh, isn't that fantastic? That's got to be a must, a must get. That's okay. That's got to be a must that's get. That's a must get. I know something that's really important to you as well is not, I was going to say is food waste, is not to waste food. So what kind of trends are you seeing there? Well, you know, when I think about trends and fads, food waste and rescuing otherwise wasted fruits and vegetables is neither a trend nor a fad. It's okay. here to stay. Yeah. I've become a global voice in the world of food waste. So talking to countries and companies to meet their sustainability initiatives. But it's very important we start at home. Absolutely in British Columbia. We, you know, the world grows enough food and we can't feed everyone in the world. And that hurts as a chef to not be able to feed everyone. Right. So we really have to pay attention and provide some solutions to the farmers and manufacturers and grocery stores and us at home. So I brought a, a, a selection of fruits and vegetables. Okay. It doesn't have to be the world's most beautiful apple. Well, there. Well, this is a pretty. Oh, I see. A little bit of bruising. Right. A little bit. Cut it off. Cut it off. Absolutely. A little bit of. A little bit of. Uh, I don't know what on the ex, on the. But exterior inside of the that eggplant is going to taste beautiful. Your apple doesn't have to be a Chanel boutique of an apple. Right. We have to think about how we're going to rescue the otherwise wasted fruits and vegetables instead of them going to waste, instead of them going to landfill. One of the solutions uh, that we are starting to see, and, and your viewers will see it in some stores, is drying those fruits and vegetables. So here's a selection. What's this? That is a dried red pepper. Wow. I have some strawberries. Have a, a dehydrator? Well, or it could be dehydrated, it mm -hmm. could be freeze-dried. Mm. Over there, there's a little bowl with the blueberries and the, they're fantastic. Look at that. 
When they when you dry it, right, mm. it's like you're standing in a blueberry field in Abbotsford. That you can have in your cereal all year long. You could put it in your it's cereal, fresh, your, your overnight stuff. oats. That packs a punch of flavor. What about putting it in your muffin? What about mm -hmm. putting mm -hmm. it in your, you know, in your in your dressings to have some Trying. fruit in it? Love it. What else? Apples. Apples. Look at these orange slices. Now, aren't they? You can dry orange slices. Yes. Oh my! Isn't that interesting? Actually, that adds a whole other mm -hmm. texture and flavor to mm -hmm. an orange, doesn't it? And it's still bright in your mouth. It's, it's, hint, of, it's hint of orange. Exactly. Mm. One of my favorites are the little bowl in the middle, and that's dried cherry tomatoes. Oh, now, I make them into a risotto. I stir it into the risotto and then add the more Parmigiano mm. cheese. Mm. That is gorgeous, but I don't think I'm going to have enough to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to dry them out. From the ones from my garden are going straight into my mouth exactly. I don't know when they're fresh. So, you know, we, we talk about rescuing food, and it is important. So, uh, you know, a challenge to your viewers is give me a call. I'd love to have that conversation and help any of the companies, farmers or manufacturers or restaurateurs, think about solutions because it's now. Christine, well, wow, you have really covered a lot of territory with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. You're most welcome. Don't forget, it's all about taste, taste, taste. Hi, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music, and I'd like to share with you the story about a return of a groundbreaking band from Quebec called Carqua. The band recently released their first album in 13 years. More on that in a moment, but first, I'm gonna take you back to an earlier song from this great French-Canadian band. Going back to their third album from 2008, which has since gone gold, by the way, that is Carqua from Montreal with Oubli Pa. Now, throughout the early stages of Carqua's career, they found almost immediate success in their home province of Quebec, but it wasn't until their fourth album, called Les Chemins de Verre, when Carqua really broke out. They won both the Juno Award for Francophone Album of the Year, and they became the first ever French language band to win the Polaris Music Prize for the Best Canadian Album of the Year, based on artistic merit as chosen by the critics. Beating out the likes of Broken Social Scene, Tegan and Sarah, Dan Mangan, and others in 2010. There you go, from the award-winning album of the same name, that's Carqua with Les Chemins de Verre from 2010, and that album has also gone gold. Now, just two years later, in 2012, Carqua announced a surprising hiatus, which has lasted a long time. Now, lead singer Louis-Jean Cormier went on to a great solo career, but nothing more from Carqua until now. 13 years after their last album, the band has finally returned with a whole new record, and the video for the first single features Quebec actor Pascal Boussier.
Very nice. That's Carqua with Parfait à l'écran. Their first single from their first album in over a decade. Welcome back, Carqua. The album is out now. They have a mostly sold out tour of Quebec on the books for this fall with a sold Toronto show in December. And Carqua is the band that you need to add to your Canadian music playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. I'll check in with you again soon. Coming up, the evolution of school lunch and connecting kids to where their food comes from. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. While kids are in school, why not teach them something practical, like how to grow their own produce and how to prepare it for lunch? That's what they're doing in Lunch Lab at Lord Roberts Elementary in Vancouver. And it's the subject of this documentary, courtesy of the CBC Creator Network. So it's almost time for the kids to come in for lunch. Can you hear that? We never tell them what it is because we want them to be open to try anything new. The way that schools are, are structured really encourage students to see food as kind of a byproduct in, in the school day. Canada is one of the only uh, developed countries that does not have a federal nutrition program in schools of any variety. So there's communities where there's amazing things happening, but mostly that's not the case. And I think that's the urgency. The opportunity we have here at school is to develop those healthy eating habits, not just about what they eat, but how they eat, and feel confident in preparing food and eating food and in trying new things. All is planted in the garden with purple flowers. See if you can find them. You see it? We got a ladybug. Ladybugs often distract us. I am in a unique position. I teach edible education as a prep. So I have the opportunity to teach every single student in the school once a week. Okay. We need to pull up the plant, and then where are the actual potatoes going to be? What are these? Potatoes. They're a type of potato called warba potatoes. We're seeing potatoes. this trend exist in society where children are more and more disconnected from where their food comes from. You get them in the garden, and they'll, they'll, they'll munch on kale, they'll eat lettuce, they'll pick peas, they'll harvest potatoes, and it just becomes natural. And Lunch Lab really builds off of that. So food has always been a, a real passion of mine, and I actually came back to teaching from a different career. Met Chef TJ, who is a parent here at the school, and we started having conversations with Growing Chefs and Fresh Roots, which are two awesome and innovative nonprofits here in Vancouver, and began to dream, what could a lunch program look like, and how deeply could we get students involved in that? I want to now move on to some of the favorite things that you, that you learned in Lunch Lab. I'm gonna go one by one this time, actually. Probably how exhausting, yeah, fun it is to feed 200 people. Yeah, I agree with you. Lunch Lab is a fun and educational program that allows grade six and seven students to be involved as chefs in preparing a meal for their peers. We train about 80 students a year and they have the awesome opportunity to be able to work alongside chefs to learn skills of communication, yes, knife and food safety, around how to work as a team. We're on our 13th try, guys. And that becomes something that they, week after week, become more confident in. That means it's ready. I didn't ever think that just a bunch of kids could feed 200 students, so it's kind of cool. When you make it yourself, it tastes better. This is good. My favorite thing is like working together with all the students and you know working with chefs and learning a lot more about like kitchen rules and safety and creating food for other people that they enjoy eating. I really enjoy that. The difference we see when students first come in sometimes literally holding the knife upside down, where by the end, they know exactly what they're doing.
It's all about getting it to be fun, communal. We all eat together. Students have choice. They can take the time they need. We deliberately give them more time. Lunch should be the most exciting part of a school day. And, and having that ability to just enjoy a meal together, I think is so much of, of what it is to be human. It's hard to express quickly why school food matters because it, it touches on so many different parts of our society. There's health, there's education, there's food security, food sovereignty, the environment, community economic development. There's all these pieces that school food can impact and will impact. The Coalition for Healthy School Food is the largest school food network in Canada, made up of over 260 nonprofit organizations from coast to coast to coast. And collectively, the coalition is advocating for public investment in a universal healthy school food program that would ensure all K-12 students have access to healthy food at school every day. I think Lunch Lab is, yeah, one of the kind of exemplary programs in BC or across Canada, showcasing the potential for what school food can look like in the future with public investment. Uh, Lunch Lab is an awesome place to try new things and meet new people, and it's like always different foods and stuff like, and I think it's an awesome place. You really should come here because it has excellent food. It's always nice to have more friends and to try different foods, and you'll learn a lot. There's lots of cultures and like different kinds of foods, foods from every country sometimes, and it's really cool because some of these foods I've never tried before. Coconut pineapple curry, I didn't think I'd ever like that. <laughs> and it sounded really gross to begin with, but I tried it and it actually tastes really nice. You spent so much time preparing everything, and then when you get to try it, it's like, wow, this is really good, and it was made by 12 year olds. Up until this year, school food programs have been run through kind of a patchwork of funding and a school champion that has seen a need and started a program up from scratch. This year, 2023, is the first time we've seen dedicated funding for school meal programs in the BC budget. And this is the largest single investment in school food in Canadian history. And it's a really exciting time to see our collective advocacy spark something huge. Lunch Lab is possible because of how amazing this community is. Whether that's the chefs, whether that's the students, whether that's the parents. And I think this is where school districts need to work with the community that they have to imagine programs that are not just feeding children, but are engaging children that are giving students an opportunity to have a voice. And I think that's a bit of a radical educational idea. And I'm really hopeful to see how Lunch Lab can contribute to that movement here in BC. This is our Vancouver. Beyonce is an icon in music and in dance, and even before she brought her Renaissance tour to BC Place, Beyonce inspired dozens of choreographers and other artists to surprise the public with a flash mob at Waterfront Station. the little ones all the way to like the whole community, everyone of all ages joining in. It was really fun. Uh, so TransLink approached us. They have a program called Art Moves, which brings artists, uh, musicians, dancers, uh, poets into the, the SkyTrain system. TransLink recognized that um, ridership was low post-pandemic. Uh, also recognize that art and culture is something that they want to support and that really helps build community and makes riders feel safe and seen in their system. You know, once music starts and then watching other people yeah. dancing, we're just grooving around. The elderly, they're not even moving, but they, their eyes are like... They're in it. In it. Yeah. And then like, that makes me happy. I'm like, okay. Like we are like having like some 
conversation between the eyes. In the ultimate present state. Yeah. I guess because you're so connected. Like, we look at each other and we're like, oh, we're in this thing together. And seeing them dance in the public, no fear, doing what they love to do, is actually like gave me and gave us like some energy to create, inspired us a lot. I think art can give us, um, people heal, people can connect together to do things like this so that we can uh, use the tool of art or in dance to bring the people together and feel the love and then we can share the love. Of course, we know the Queen Beyonce is coming on Monday, and who doesn't love Beyonce? So we had not yet done a flash mob. This was our most ambitious event to date in the uh, transit space, and uh, we think it was a great success. When breakdancing premieres at the Olympics in Paris, Vancouver's Phil Wizard is set to represent Canada. We'll have his story coming up. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. World champion b-boy Philip Kim, a.k.a. Phil Wizard, is set to represent Canada when breakdancing makes its Olympic debut in Paris next year. Just watch as he shares what he did to get here and how he's preparing for the future. I thought about giving up many times, but something inside me pushed me forward. When I started in Vancouver, there was a local crew called the Never Never Crew. Khalifa Kush, Shatter Space, Voltra. So they were performing in front of the art gallery and I saw it and I was kind of blown away. I thought, oh, this looks super cool. I want to give it a try. Uh, um, and that was kind of my introduction to the dance. I'm definitely excited to hopefully go to the Olympics and also um, the Pan Am Games as well. It should be a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, my kind of mentality with breaking with any event that I go to is I just kind of take it with a grain of salt. I'm going to have the best time that I can. I'm going to do the best that I can. Um, my motto has always been the same, it, which is like stay ready so I don't have to get ready. I would say I'm more focused now um, and there's a lot more like physical conditioning. Um, but at the same time, I for any event, I never wanted to change the way that I dance. I never want to change the way that I approach it. I think I've made it this far being myself, being authentically myself and kind of representing myself on the stage. So that's what I'm going to keep doing um, and hopefully um, continue to to successfully do that, but we'll see. Keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. There are so many characters. It's like watching a superhero movie. Like it's like trying to compare Batman and Superman. They're very different, you know. And maybe one day Superman will win. Maybe one day Batman will win. But they approach uh, uh, the the way they approach um, whatever they do is super different. But they're equally as powerful. And I'm looking forward to more people seeing it. What am I chasing now? The Team Canada dream. That's kind of the biggest thing and the biggest opportunity that comes from something like the Olympics. It's a platform that we normally would not have access to. And so it's people that normally would not see breaking. And that's the most exciting thing for me, um, for people to see it and fall in love with it, like I said. Um, because um, when I was a kid, this was what I fell in love with. This was everything to me. And, and I hope to see that spark in other people as well. This is our Vancouver. It's an opportunity to reimagine the city. Ghetto is the brainchild of Henry Case Partners Architecture, and it challenges people to think about issues like refugees, tourists, and equity. I had a chance to speak to architect Gregory Henry Case about it on our afternoon radio show on the coast. Now, ghetto, it's an interesting word to, to choose here. What, what was the original vision for, for the ghetto exhibition? Well, the word ghetto uh, stems from the Jewish ghetto in Venice from the 16th century, when the Jews were segregated within the context of uh, uh, the, you know, the Venetian city. And so it has a lot of historical context within and was used uh, in the Venice Biennale because the European Cultural Center had invited us to uh, exhibit right beside the, uh, the original ghetto, and so the whole project sort of emerged from, the, from this context. 
Okay, so Ghetto has traveled from Venice to the Art Gallery of Ontario, now to Vancouver. What, what would you say are some of the, the common themes between these cities? Well, it, all, it has to do with uh, a larger issue of uh, a partnership with the uh, uh, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which we're, we're advocates for, and how this project really saw itself as an advocate for the whole question about how can we all live for live together, what is a citizen city, and what are the issues around inclusivity and belonging that our cities need to address so that this little planet that we live on can embrace each other and, and, uh, and survive. In your view, what, what is a citizen city? Well, a citizen city has to do with, with everything from diversity, you know, cities that like Toronto and London that have huge ethnic diversities, to, to affordability, which is things that we struggle with in Vancouver, obviously, and, and issues of uh, gender and race identity as well, in terms of uh, LGBTQ uh, issues as well, and disabilities. And so this full spectrum of the question of what inclusivity is, is not only about architecture, it's about society as a whole. But you, you do have an architecture firm. You are an architect. What do you see as the role uh, of an architect in, in shaping a city? Well, that's where this project comes in. This project was a specific installation in the context of Venice, which then gets transposed into Vancouver. And both projects sort of uh, are, are, are architectural projects, but they take as a starting point, the community amenity contribution concept of Vancouver, where in Venice, timeshare condominiums are used to fund refugee housing for Iranian refugees. And in Vancouver, this uh, new hotels which are needed in Vancouver could fund refugee housing in our waterborne site at the, at the entrance to Falls Wait Creek. Wait a second. So a tourist comes to Vancouver, mm -hmm. you check into a hotel, and part of your rate would be was taken off the top and, and re redirected to... Refugees in this fictional landscape. Yes. Okay. Fifty percent of the of, of this uh, this uh, project would be refugee housing, and fifty percent would be hotels uh, f um, for tourists. And the tourists' income from the tourists would fund the refugee housing. Okay, but you say this is just a, a concept. Where where does the conversation go? Well, this is something that Vancouver has been very good at, uh, in, in terms of its capturing the equity. Uh, created in the development process to do things like social housing or schools or daycares or or uh, libraries like we're doing at Oak Ridge or we've done at Woodward's and places like that. Um, this is taking it a step further to actually uh, really aggressively target the issue of refugees which and, and question the whole issue around our responsibility, our global responsibility to, to help one another. Okay, so in this exhibition, we we'll go to the Museum of Vancouver. What do we see? What's that experience like? You're going to see two parts to it. The original exhibition from Venice, which talks all about uh, the relationship to four installations in Venice, and then a new one, which is a, a whole model and sort of fictional rezoning of, uh, of a project off the coast of False Creek in Vancouver for actually proposing something in, in Vancouver, to, very similar. And uh, he has a big rezoning sign, and the, even the director of planning, Teresa, let us put her name on the rezo fictional rezoning sign within the context of the museum. And so we're hoping it sparks dialogue. At the end of this program, we like to tip our hats to our talented photojournalists on staff at CBC Vancouver. So there was the Beyonce tour, Queen Bee, Mrs. Carter, whatever you call her, she is a trendsetter. And when she asked fans to help celebrate her birthday wearing silver to her show, Vancouverites responded en masse. We want to go back and show you a selection of the many shiny pre-show shots taken by our Ben Nelms. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye.